Okay, everyone, <clears throat> welcome back for our final talk for this for this year's Virtual Vendor Summit. Uh, we have Peter from Ampere here to talk about FreeBSD and, and using FreeBSD um, in Oracle's cloud. So I'll hand it over to Peter. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time to talk about this stuff. Let me uh, see if I can get my slides up real quick. Screen share. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'm good. Can you see that? If you can, then we're having a party. Yep. Looks good. Awesome. So my name is Peter Pouliot, as was mentioned. I'm from Ampere Computing. Uh, we're a cloud native processor company. And uh, I have Ed, I guess, joining me as well. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is a little bit about the uh, timeline for FreeBSD Cloud Enablement, uh, specifically in terms of OCI. Uh, give you a little information upon the chipsets that we have uh, enabled in OCI, specifically the Ampere Ultra. Uh, talk about our instances that are available uh, for development. Uh, and a little bit about the uh, the free tier that Oracle provides for uh, developers to have access because it's a little different than the rest. Um, and then give you a demo of uh, using FreeBSD uh, in Oracle's cloud via uh, via Terraform. So, uh, and then after that, we'll have some uh, questions and answers and some links that you guys can peruse to. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'd we can say, I guess it started in uh, 2020 with uh, FreeBSD uh, promoting um, AR64 to tier one status. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, that adds another kind of a, a stronger level of support from the community around those images and production of those, uh, those images and curation of those images and ensuring that there'll be a, a standard kind of a release pipeline around that. Um, and, and over the last uh, couple of years, we've been, uh, uh, the, the team has been essentially working uh, with the folks at Oracle um, to uh, get images into the cloud, as well as to validate those images on the, um, the Ampere A1 instances that are available. In uh, 2022, so this year, uh, the 13.1 uh, release was, uh, became available in the OCI marketplace. So uh, kind of as a, uh, a, a nice flag in the ground. And uh, it currently uh, going forward, they're working on providing uh, support for bare metal instances in Oracle's cloud as well. So I mentioned free tier, obviously, uh, you know, we're talking about install media, binary packages, um, as well as, uh, you know, interface stability. And in this case, cloud images, right? Making sure that we have curated up-to-date cloud images in, in native cloud providers, uh, marketplaces. Uh, and also security updates and a, a curation process of CI and test kind of behind all that. Ooh, I went too far. So uh, this year we donated a, a couple new platforms to the, uh, the FreeBSD Foundation to, uh, help use and help developers uh, work on. Um, what you're looking at there is one of our, uh, I believe it is a Mount Collins platform that uh, that we have one on, the, on Ed's desk and one is uh, racked in Iraq. And some uh, a, a pretty view of all the of all the sexy cores that are now available for uh, for development on and for you guys to to play with. So uh, the platform there has, uh, I believe, 160 cores across two uh, two sockets. So um, you know, one of the things with Ampere is we have the highest core density in the industry. So it can it can uh, basically give you a, a lot of uh, a, a lot of compute power in a in a small dense uh, form factor, which is which is pretty nice. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Ampere. You know, our, our mission as a as a company is to be the leader in uh, cloud native compute platforms, and we do it by delivering innovation, performance, and value at a pace uh, where that customers need. Um, I've been at Ampere for three and a half years. Uh, our primary focus in the beginning was solely on providing uh, high density compute for um, cloud providers, and you know what we've realized is we have a we have a great uh, processor that's uh, you know capable of uh, essentially helping people, you know, reduce, uh, reduce their carbon footprint in their data center while increasing their real estate and increasing their compute capacity. 
So, you know, we like to call it the first cloud native processor. We started using that terminology uh, when we first came into the market. Um, and specifically, we look at it from the perspective of uh, when we architected the chips, uh, looking at to meet the needs of the cloud providers. So uh, what that means in our case is we have a you know single uh, thread per core. Um, we have lots of cores and we use a lot less uh, electricity than our competitors. Uh, we currently have two chips in the market, an 80 core, uh, which is what is located what is uh, found in the Mount Collins uh, platforms that I mentioned, and 128 core. And the uh, the the key difference of those, uh, primarily that one is a little more suited for high performance. The 80 core uh, has a, a couple extra layers of uh, additional cache uh, and uh, the 128 core is for higher density, um, but they are socket compatible. So for those of you used to using uh, uh, legacy processors, you'll be able to, uh, you could potentially swap out those, those chips. So, uh, you know, one of the fundamental things that Ampere is really proud of is our uh, efficiency of our uh, of our platforms, right? So, um, you know, currently, uh, if you're using x86 and you're looking to grow your existing uh, data center footprint, uh, you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, a 2x increase of uh, server power and a 1.6 times increase of uh, real estate needed to house that compute. Whereas if you, by using Ampere's processors, we can actually reduce the amount of uh, power you consume and uh, while also decreasing the amount of uh, real estate space needed to house that. So, you know, we like to say we have industry leading performance, industry leading uh, power efficiency. And we also, we also do a lot of work through, uh, you know, open standards. So, um, you know, we do a lot of work with open firmware on our platforms. So uh, as another example, HP recently started shipping a, one of the, their servers, the ProLine RL300, uh, with our chip in it. And that's one of the first enterprise platforms to ship with OpenBMC as an option. So, um, you know, we're really proud of, uh, of that sort of stuff. So, and, and obviously, you know, because we have a single uh, thread per core and lots of cores, the performance for a lot of the standard cloud native uh, workloads um, is, is increased. So uh, as you can see here, you know, we have like a 3.8% increase uh, for web services like Nginx. Um, uh, we have a, a basically a, we're consistent and predictable because our cores have a pin frequency. So when you're hyper threading, you get fluctuation in the in the frequency of the cores, whereas ours, it's a it's pinned at a consistent uh, three gigahertz. So that way you can all you can assure that you're always getting uh, three gigahertz even for in the case of a cloud provider when it's being cut off. Um, and uh, yeah, because we have so many cores, we have uh, unprecedented linear scalability. So, um, you know, for certain workloads, they won't even take advantage of all the cores. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, our, our low power uh, consumption uh, comparatively to, a, to an Intel uh, Xeon, we use uh, roughly half the electricity. So the, the TDP of our uh, Ultra and Ultra Max is 250, where the TDP of the high-end uh, Xeon is about 500. So you can imagine that can uh, when you're, you're nickel and diming uh, in your data center for compute power, um, it's, uh, it's you know, somewhere where you can reclaim uh, some, some extra, <laughs> extra watts. And obviously, you know, talking about the just sheer density, um, you know, when you're uh, dealing with um, legacy processor architectures, uh, you know, and I've been in this situation myself, uh, where you've had to basically remove capacity from the racks to be able to uh, have enough power um, and enough cooling in the rack to, to be suitable for the operation of those servers. Whereas based on our, our power envelope um, and our heat envelope, uh, as well as our compute density, we can we can get a lot more compute power uh, in the rack um, than our than our competition. So, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be talking about a little bit about Oracle's cloud. Now, Oracle's a little bit new to the to the cloud game. Uh, they have a phenomenal uh, free tier, uh, which basically has a, a bunch of services. Uh, that you can get that are always free all the time. The big one that I'm a big fan of is they give uh, you the ability to have uh, four uh, cores and 24 gigs of memory of Ampere's uh, A1 compute instances so that you can cut up in any way uh, you want. 
So uh, I use it all the time for a, for a development environment because um, it's it, it actually works uh, really well. And uh, essentially, with that much compute, you can usually do uh, what you need to do and prototype and uh, figure figure stuff out um, relatively uh, quickly and, and easily without having to accrue uh, additional costs. So and there's a bunch of other other uh, things that are uh, available, um, and there's uh, as I said other other free services that uh, are available for open source projects as well through the ARM Accelerator program. So here's a, a screenshot of uh, the FreeBSD in the OCI marketplace. Um, so that was uh, to me a pretty it, it was a it was a big deal for us at Ampere because uh, you know obviously we want to have parity. From an operating system perspective, and uh, I've been a big fan of BSD for most of my career. So having uh, having FreeBSD as one of the first extra options available uh, for Ampere platforms was a was a pretty exciting thing for me. Uh, so uh, that's that's what it looks like if you go to see it in the marketplace. And then what I'm going to show you next is uh, essentially some uh, some Terraform that I wrote uh, a while back. It's a Terraform module that it utilizes the OCI always free tier uh, to essentially uh, get a, a combination of instances. Uh, it will create all the necessary uh, network infrastructure needed uh, to launch those instances and provide remote access to them. Uh, it'll also uh, dynamically creates uh, SSH keys and other, other needed things that will be needed for accessing the instance. Um, it'll actually, uh, we also pass in a cloud init, uh, metadata file, um, to tell it to do some things, uh, on the first boot, uh, of that instance. Uh, there's been some work, uh, by the, the FreeBSD team, um, and Dave, uh, uh, essentially to help enable that, um, functionality. Uh, so essentially you get parity, uh, with Linux instances, uh, in terms of being able to ingest metadata. Um, and then, uh, uh, as I said, we're going to launch the A1 instances using the uh, the latest curated FreeBSD image that's found in the marketplace. So I have some Terraform code that will actually detect what that is and uh, and look at it. And then we'll expose expose the, the instance to the outside world so we can SSH into it. So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop and share my other screen, although I think I might be able to do it from here. All right, so oops. <laughs> I'm going to kill that because I had a already pre-typed the command. So, so what I'm first going to do is uh, initialize the um, the Terraform repository, and that's just going to ensure that we have all the necessary plugins needed. And then very quickly we can show I'll show you too what the code looks like. So this is because I'm just utilizing a module that I created. This is the uh, what the actual code I'm using to instantiate it looks like. We're pulling it from a source module located here. And then I, I actually do a little abstraction of the operating system uh, selection. So I, I'm just able to pass in FreeBSD as a string to tell it to use FreeBSD. And then this is, we're going to pass in some metadata. So this is the just simple metadata uh, file that we're going to use, install some packages, tell it to update itself, uh, add a user and add a group uh, with that user in it. And then uh, cat uh, some, echo some uh, a phrase into the MOTD. So to keep it simple, I'm just going to the basically the Terraform workflow. It's pretty for those who haven't used it. It's it's pretty simple. You first run a Terraform init, as I just did previously to initialize. Uh, then that follows by a Terraform plan, which uh, essentially goes through the, the code and ensures that, uh, you know, it can perform the tasks in the order at which the tasks uh, and it discovers the order at which the tasks need to be applied. And then uh, essentially once that's done, we run a Terraform apply, uh, which will actually go ahead and instantiate the instances. So I'm gonna do this all at the same time using that uh, 
that string that I have right there. So here's the initialization. And now it's going to start uh, computing what the plan is going to be. And then once, so this is the output of the plan. And then once the plan's done, it uh, we're going to execute it executes it via the Terraform apply. So this is the actual execution occurring right now. And as you can see, it's creating the subnets. Hopefully the demo gods are going to smile on me nicely. <laughs> it's creating a local uh, SSH key for me to utilize to get into the instance. And it's starting to create the instance. Now I have found once the instance is created, it will take a, a minute or you know, about a minute uh, before we can log in. So that is the external IP address that we're going to use. And I'm going to use the newly generated key to get into that. The user I'm going to use is just a user called FreeBSD. Just going to wait another minute or a few more seconds to give it some time to come up because I found that uh, it does take a moment. Yeah, still going to wait. But basically, this is the same experience that you would have on, uh, well, other API-driven clouds, launching instances, passing in metadata via CloudNet, and uh, being able to access them later through a um, through an external IP. There we go. And we're in. So, as uh, and just to show the execution of the cloud in it. So it's currently, I believe, doing the uh, the upgrade of the packages on the system as part of as I told it to do uh, via the metadata file. So this is part of the log output of that processing happening. Now, uh, if we wanted to kind of end this, what I'll do, I'll show you how to destroy the instance. So essentially I logged out and then from a Terraform perspective, it's as simple as typing Terraform destroy. And then I'm going to auto approve of that. So I don't have to uh, confirm it later. And now when I type this, it will remove any artifact that Terraform created during the run. So the SSH keys that I had dynamically created, it'll remove all the instances, well, the instance that I had created. And it'll also uh, remove all the networking and all the other pieces that were instantiated uh, during the Terraform run. 
Um, I'm a big fan of this because from a, a work, like basically a work uh, workflow, uh, it allows you to, um, you know, try it, try something and remove it as though it never existed in the first place, which is, uh, which is key for cloud operations because you could always have some little stranded artifact uh, left behind that will incur you cost that you'll find out uh, in a bill later. So, um, so I will now run and destroy the instance. And it's going to go through and start removing the same sort of uh, the same kind of process it went before, just uh, removing it all. To destroying the uh, public key. So those lines that we see right here on the bottom, that's the, there's some uh, language in the code that essentially because it's in the, uh, the application catalog that you have to accept. So the code actually does that stuff for you. And now it's removing the instance itself. There we go. So that's the full life cycle from kind of beginning to end to show really the easy use, uh, how easy it is to get uh, kind of using uh, FreeBSD in, inside of OCI, especially with Terraform. Um, as you can tell, like that was reasonably quick for uh, for both instantiation and um, and destruction. So uh, so yeah, let's go back to the I guess to the slide deck now. And I'll pull that up. All right. So a couple more things for folks to uh, take a peek at. There's a blog on the Ampere website, which goes into more details about um, kind of what, what I just did here. If you guys want to reread it or check it out, feel free. Um, the Terraform module that I use, the exa exact example can be found in this uh, subdirectory of the module. Um, there's some more, uh, some surprisingly, uh, I was very, very pleased when I first started working with, uh, with OCI. They had a, they've done a huge amount of effort to document um, things uh, regarding their, uh, their Terraform usage and the ability to use Terraform with their cloud. Uh, and they've actually done a really nice job with it. So, um, yeah, it was a um, it was a pleasant surprise, and uh, the uh, you know there's more documentation and reference architectures that can be found on that other Oracle link below. So I guess after that, I will uh, thank everybody and open up the floor for questions if people have questions. And I guess, are they able to type questions into the- uh, Yes, the... I'm looking on like IRC or in the Zoom Q&A, but so far we just don't have any questions, that's all. Nope, that's fine. Uh, well, I guess if we don't have any questions, then uh, yeah, thanks guys for, for having me. I appreciate the time to, to talk about this and uh, yeah, hope everybody has a, a rest of a great uh, virtual summit. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So, oh, I guess we actually had a question just pop up. Yeah, and I can tell you on the, I mean, if I get my window to work, I can tell you that on IRC, um, there was lots of uh, envy of having that many cores. I'll, I'll put it that way. Oh, I can. <laughs> so my background uh, it is in OpenStack and uh, spent 10 years working on OpenStack, uh, five and a half of it. I spent uh, working for Microsoft on OpenStack. Uh, and I ran during my time at Microsoft, I ran the largest uh, continuous integration infrastructure in all of OpenStack. I had uh, 38 racks of gear. 
uh, I got to stand up and open stack while I was at um, here at Ampere over the pandemic that within a single rack, I had more cores than uh, the 38 racks of gear I had um, had while I was working for Microsoft. So I, I can promise you it's, it makes me giddy uh, when I uh, when I see that. Um, essentially, well, there's no threads. So I saw the, the processor that uh, is in the OCI is the Ampere Ultra. Uh, we have a single thread per core. So um, we don't do hyper-threading. So essentially, um, yeah, you don't have to worry about how many threads per core. You can just uh, pass them along to each core. So unlike, uh, whereas you get in other clouds, if you're using hyper-threads, you believe they give you uh, two virtual cores um, to get to a, to a, a full core. Uh, with us, you actually get the whole core. Um, so from a um, yeah, performance perspective, uh, essentially, uh, you know, it, it gives the, uh, what is the advantage? Yeah, you're right. The, there is an advantage and something more reliable about having a, a single thread per core. Uh, from a uh, cloud provider perspective, it eliminates the noisy neighbor where if you're, if you can imagine there's, um, you know, contention uh, for the core and uh, potentially, uh, you know, you can get, uh, I guess, you know, like feedback <laughs> from, or, or uh, it, because of that contention can cause unreliability. Uh, the additional uh, kind of uh, piece of uh, reliability from our perspective is that because you're getting a single thread per core and that single core has a consistent frequency, uh, whereas in a hyper-threaded environment, you have um, multiple uh, essentially, the the frequency changes because of the contention uh, for the core itself. Uh, we can deliver a, a ba basically a better uh, uh, usage pattern and more reliable usage pattern and a consistently, uh, basically, uh, yeah, uh, of that of that core. So uh, we call it predictability. So you know you can predict the performance you're going to get uh, because it's consistent. Um, so uh, yeah, that's what I would say. And then I have a couple of questions from IRC. Um, and I'll, you, you, can, you can just answer them the best that you would like to answer. The first yeah. question is how far would you trust Oracle? All right. The, the, no, that's a, that's a great question. And I can, and as Ed knows, uh, because when we first met and I first proposed the idea of, uh, of this, uh, I've been working in open source for 25 years. I started working uh, professionally in open source for a company called Zimian that created Gnome. And uh, I, I can tell you that, um, you know, Oracle as a company does not, you know, they've done some stuff historically that isn't always uh, very open source friendly, right? Um, so, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's been a challenge uh, at times uh, when working with open source projects uh, to tr try to get over that, that barrier. Now, what I can what I can tell you is uh, this is a service company, right? So this isn't the the same, uh, I guess the the same people that uh, had done, uh, you know, that I guess were involved in some of those things historically in the past. The mentality of the folks operating the cloud is a little bit is a little bit different because they are a service provider providing infrastructure. So and they're well aware of um, of kind of the history and the challenges that they have. Uh, from that standpoint. So I, I can tell you, I've been using this for two years now, and um, it is, ex I've had uh, extreme reliability with it. Uh, I actually, because of my, uh, my tenure in OpenStack, uh, I know some of the individuals um, who I used to work with on OpenStack went to work for Oracle and helped them build this iteration of the cloud. Uh, so from that perspective, I, uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of insight into that, and I trust well, I, I trust those individuals from my time being spent uh, doing engineering with them. So, um, so yeah, I would say I, you know, I, I would, I can, I, I trust it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the, um, the other cloud providers, they, you know, they obviously are a little bit newer to the game uh, from that perspective, but they're also uh, very hungry and they're looking to differentiate themselves uh, explicitly uh, you know, in some cases through the offering that they have with the Ampere chips from a, um, you know, ARM native uh, compute perspective, 
and I know that, uh, you know, they're very uh, in tune in terms of, uh, you know, trying to build a great uh, user experience uh, of their cloud, which I can promise you, I was pleasantly surprised uh, at how easy it, it, it was to use, especially, um, you know, being a Terraform fan and wanting to do uh, everything in Terraform across uh, cloud providers. So they have spent a significant amount of time both uh, integrating um, Terraform usage into their, uh, you know, like web portal and user experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think they are, uh, they, they are a, a trustworthy cloud provider from, from uh, that standpoint. Um, I'm sure people will have other opinions, but, uh, you know, as I said, from, um, I can understand the position, uh, especially having uh, worked in open source and, uh, you know, looking at their history that some folks might be wary. And uh, in all cases, I, I will say that the the different projects that I've worked with have all seemed to have a, a pleasant experience uh, with working both with the OCI team uh, as well as uh, with using Oracle's cloud. So, okay. And I know Ed actually spoke up on IRC while you were answering and said that, that in his experience, um, the OCI team has been great to work with. So, another question I had um, this is partly in jest. I want to quote it correctly. Is there such a thing as enough cores? Uh, well, uh, no, right? Because the more dense uh, compute, the more uh, and the more efficient that compute is, the more uh, the more we can fit into the data center. So I, I'm in New England. I live in the Metro Boston area, and uh, my background is in uh, part in the telecommunications industry. And uh, I can promise you, we have buildings here that are never going to go away. And those buildings aren't going to get more electricity into them and aren't going to get more racks. So uh, from that perspective, being able to have high density compute allows for further usage of that uh, infrastructure without having to, uh, you know, increase capital investment. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, more cores is, is always uh, is always going to be uh, going to be better. Um, and in fact, you know, Ampere. Uh, you know, as we showed already with the 80 core and our 128 core, I can promise you the next chip that uh, is in our is in our horizon will have more cores. So, um, so yeah, we want to lead the industry in core density and and continue to do that for the foreseeable future. And then I'll, I'll answer: Are there some low hanging fruit missing for FreeBSD and OCI? Yeah, I, the the things that I've noticed so far, maybe a little bit of uh, there's a couple. Um, Things, especially on the cloud and it side, maybe uh, on the logging side, that uh, need to be cleaned up for parity with how uh, uh, cloud and it logs its output and execution uh, during uh, first instance boot. Um, right now, as you saw in the demo, it was all primarily uh, all the output was was going straight to messages. Um, in uh, in other distributions, those. Uh, those get broken out into sublog files, which makes it a little bit easier for for reading um, stuff. Uh, but so far, so good. I have to say, uh, it's you know, it's worked. Uh, the, the guys uh, that have been working on it have done a great job, and uh, you know, it it works like uh, to me. It has parity from uh, Linux uh, from that perspective uh, in terms of uh, how it's used and its ability to be used and consumed. So, um, you know, the, the functionality for the cloud and it pieces that allow you to automate are there. Uh, so it's just a matter of, I think, of a little bit of nuance uh, and, or a little more, maybe a little, little bit of polish in some fringe corners of, of that sort of stuff to, to make it, uh, uh, I guess, see a, a completely uh, with parity uh, for, for Linux hosts. But uh, yeah, I, that, th that's the big one. And then the other, the other piece, obviously, is bare metal. Um, there was, I know there were some technical, uh, technical issues that arose and, uh, I believe those are all, um, they've been worked on. I think some of them, uh, are just waiting for the code to actually, uh, make it into release. Uh, but, uh, once there's bare metal, uh, available, uh, you know, once the bare metal stuff is, uh, fully functional, then you'll be able to essentially in the same way I stood up instances, you know, uh, a, a four core instance here, you'll be able to do that with uh, bare metal instances using FreeBSD on OCI. And in that case, you can get up to, uh, I believe it's 160 cores, much like the um, the, the Mount Collins that I mentioned earlier. So uh, two, two socket configuration with 80 cores a piece. So, and that can do some uh, significant computing. Um, so uh, yeah, so yeah. 
I think those are the two areas that I know of off the top of my head that uh, could use a little a little more polish. So another question we had from IRC is, um, I think this is specific to Ampere. Do you have any quality of service guarantees? Let me state this. It's quality of service guarantees for shared caches and main memory. Huh. Yeah, that I'm not sure of off the top of my head. Um, and I would have to go back and, and do that. I know um, I know in our ultra processor, we do have a, uh, a, an L3 cache that's not present on the, on the ultra max because we remove it for more die space to get a higher density compute. Uh, but in terms of uh, specifics for SLAs, I, I'd have to look. I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay. And then I have one last question, I think, from, oh, we have one on Zoom too, but I have one more question from IRC, and then I think there's one left in the Zoom Q&A. Um, the IRC question is, um, do you have any kind of feel or judgment or opinion on the risk of maybe vendor lock-in for clouds if you're using ARM systems? Huh. Well, it's funny. Uh, in the case, you know, the only... Right now, so where the ARM instances that are found in OCI, in uh, Azure, as well as in GCE, uh, and then obviously if you're using, uh, you know, Amazon, they have their own chip that they curate and uh, and produce, right? The Graviton line. So, um, you know, I know, uh, you know, from a personal uh, perspective, um, you know, Amazon has made a lot of moves in the last year. If you read publicly what they did uh, around. Um, you know, solidifying their uh, kind of position on the ARM stuff, you know, the, their movement with uh, Amazon Linux, uh, moving from a, a CentOS base to a Fedora base was primarily done so that they could ingest uh, the, the user land changes and kernel changes that are available uh, for ARM, uh, you know, that are going upstream for ARM uh, faster. So, um, you know, and I, and I would say that, uh, you know, from a vendor lock-in perspective, um, you know, I think it's uh, it's there's diversity in the ecosystem. You know, there's other other folks, uh, other uh, cloud providers in Asia that are also uh, you know producing um, ARM chips uh, for their clouds as well as consuming ours. So um, I would say there's right now a healthy ecosystem uh, that has competition within the uh, you know the ARM processor space. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm a little biased from where I sit, and I'd like all of you to you know use Ampere processors anyway, because uh, we do have a I do feel we have a um, a performance advantage over over the um, the the competition that's out there. You know, we put a lot of effort into uh, and focus on ensuring uh, you know that we have a, a you know highly optimized cores um, as well as um, you know, highly, highly performant uh, processor uh, and uh, reference platform. So, um, so yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of the times when I think of like uh, an Amazon, Amazon's compute, it's usually, uh, you know, it's usually for uh, what I would call lowest common denominator, right? Like it's a service, gen general service platform. Uh, hold on. Let me, I'll answer the first one first. Does OCI still support ARM v7 jails or those cores are already 64 bit only? Um, I do not know if they support ARM v7 jails. Uh, our cores are ARM v8. So the ones that are found in OCI today that I know of are, uh, are Ampere cores. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I guess that. the question would be, can they run like existing 32 bit binaries? Ooh, that's a good question. I know, um, yeah, I think it, I think it depends. Uh, I know uh, Debian, for example, was having some issues with uh, running 32-bit uh, binaries on uh, the ultras, but they found some workarounds to uh, help enable that. I don't know all the, all the specifics, and I think Ed or, or one of the folks on the FreeBS team might know better for, um, for FreeBSD specifically. And then I have to be honest, I don't uh, know enough about the um, the Qualcomm Nubia stuff or, or and I'm not a lawyer to comment on uh, on on lawsuits, uh, I guess, surrounding uh, surrounding the IP of of that. So that's probably wise. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we're uh, 
being close to the end of our slot and, then, and the pace of questions on IRC has slowed down. So we might be um, at the end of questions. Uh, but I really thank you for your talk. Um, and actually some of the commentary I did on IRC was uh, thank you for the direct answers to perhaps some not as tactful questions. Um, oh, that, that's okay. I'm, I'm like I said, I've been uh, been in open source for a while, and I'm usually one of the people asking those same questions. So I can appreciate it, and it's always, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll always try to uh, to answer them as directly and honestly as I possibly can, because I know, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of us put our trust in open source software, and uh, we build, you know, relationships with folks over years. Um, working on that stuff. And uh, those are just as important as, uh, you know, friendships and other things in my, in, in my, uh, I guess, thought pattern. So, um, so yeah, thanks for, uh, I guess, thanks for asking the questions. I appreciate it. No worries. Thanks again, Peter. Anyway, thank you very much.